Are there too many people in prison? That's what I that's what I woke up to this morning when I was listening to NPR. Turns out the president is cobbling together a coalition of libertarians and act liberal activists and members of the ACLU that all agree that there are too many black people in prison and we have to start letting them out because there's there's obviously in their mind no difference between black people and white people when it comes to crime. So the only reason they're in prison, the only reason that this disparity exists is because of racism. They're serious. They're making it happen. And this is the craziest thing I've ever heard of. Hi, this is Colin Flaherty. I'm the author of Don't Make the Black Kids Angry. On this podcast, we talk about black mob violence, black on white crime, all without racism, without rancor, without apologies. And I'm really honored to welcome to this podcast tonight the most popular guest we've ever had on this podcast, the most popular guy on the, on the video videos we do, the most popular guy in the books. When people review my books, half the time they spend talking about my no good SOB guest, Mr. Marlon Newburn. (laughs) Now Marlon, you know, so let me remind people who you are. You were a psychologist, prison psychologist, court appointed psychologist for 30 years. I mean, I, you know, I think, I think of all the people in America who, who read, you know, read stuff about race and crime. I think I probably get exposed to more excuses, you know, academic wise than anybody really. And I just hear everybody. And, but until I talked to you, I didn't really hear anybody that could really look this in the eye, call it for, call it what it was without, without, without fear and without any anger or anything, but with a lot of authority, that's why I'm so happy that you're here tonight, Marlon. Mm-hmm. Well, so, I'm glad to be here. So let's let's take a minute to listen to this. Somebody, this is from 2007, but but, it, but somebody just sent it to me yesterday, and it's a clip from ABC News called "The Face of Evil." Uh, okay, so let's give that a listen. He's a mass murderer who feels nothing for his victims. What goes on inside the mind of a cold-blooded killer? Bill Weir shows us the face of evil. I feel there's two types of people in this world. Us and them. Predator and prey. Well, I'm damn sure not prey. Investigators now believe the three people found dead were Ulysses murdered. Handy is in jail on one million dollars. Ulysses Handy was 24 when he walked into a friend's home in Tacoma, Washington, looking to settle an argument and take some money. He executed Darren Christensen at point-blank range. Daniel Varro was next. Then Handy turned to a total stranger, unarmed and defenseless, 21-year-old Lindy Cochran. Did she beg for her life? She didn't say a damn word. She was shell-shocked. She knew what was coming. So you never had a second thought during any of this? No. Handy was arrested and pled guilty. At his sentencing, he spoke to the victim's families. I know there's people up here hurt. Well, pain's a part of life. Deal with it. Get over it. Deal with it. You have no compassion, no empathy for... For what? For these people whose family members you slaughtered. Man, there ain't nothing I can say, nothing I could do to bring them back. Nothing I can say could take away their pain, make it a little easier to deal with. They gone, they ain't coming back. Lindy Cochran's uncle, Richard Frost, then stepped to the front of the courtroom and expressed his feelings toward the man who took his knees. And part of the thing that's going to keep me going the rest of my life is the hope that somebody on the inside will get their hands on yeah. and choke the life out of you. Know, what was, what was right now? Power. Go ahead and laugh about it. Okay, we need, we need order, and I know, I know this is very emotional. By pleading guilty, Handy avoids death row. He is almost a year into three consecutive life sentences, and he has spent some of that time covering himself in jailhouse tattoos, a pentagram, the words sadistic, and 666 on his chest, devil horns above his eyes. And I went to Catholic schools all my life. I was an honor student, Boy Scouts, all that the choir, I went to catechism, first communion, and I mean, after a while, that wasn't me. That didn't give me pleasure. 
Handy says he felt lonely and misunderstood as a child. Feelings that turned to violence as he grew up. Something just never felt quite right to me. And I always felt that no one else feels my pain. But I can give you a small taste of it. A small taste. If I hurt you, that pain you feel can't compare to mine. And I'm not alone anymore. Well, Marlon ABC advertised that as the face of evil to a layman. It, that guy seemed pretty evil to me. Uh, what, he, he said he had no remorse. He had a great upbringing. Just decided at one point he was a black guy who was going to kill these three white kids. Uh, is that, is he unusual? No, he's not unusual at all. As a matter of fact, it, uh, uh, I, I would question his upbringing strongly. Uh, as a rule, black uh, predators, especially young ones, they uh, sugarcoat their upbringing very well, a great deal. He said he went to Catholic uh, school. He said he was oh, an yeah. altar boy, boy scout. Well, that's just that he could have been one or two of those things, but the fact is it's somebody just doesn't decide to go ahead and murder people. He doesn't have remorse. He's a garden-variety psychopath. He doesn't have a conscience. Um, this is just, it's, this is not complicated. This is not a poor, misunderstood youth. Uh, or the one is, that just drives me nuts is, um, the troubled youth. Uh, there's, there's no such animal. Street predators do what they do because they enjoy it. It's what they do. It's a preferred lifestyle. Killing in the black community among young predators, young black predators, is a with uh, with no remorse, is a sign of status. Uh, the colder you are, the more vicious you are, the greater status you have among your peers. And so this is driven hard by um, that, uh, one, and it's a primary culture of the black community. It's not a subculture. Any kind of a uh, behavior that's defended is part of the primary culture. And so, and so let me ask you, so, the other, so I was listening, watching a video the other day, and they ran through some crime numbers. One in three black men are, end up in prison or, you know, in prison or parole at some point in their mm -hmm. life. And, and so that's so. There, let's just say there's a, a small. Let's say there's a cr criminal element. But you said something that I'm very interested in is, what about all the people who defend and enable that element? Isn't that's kind of the scary part to me? They're scarier than the criminals. That's the reason there are so many black um, males and females now in prison because it's a defended behavior. Any aberrant behavior, in an antisocial behavior that's defended, financed, uh, where personal responsibility is displaced, uh, you get more of it. Okay, All those things are all done by um, the black um, victim uh, industry. Uh, nobody's responsible in the black community. It's always somebody else's fault, usually a white person. They've demonized whites for no reason at all, I might add. You know, I, I was, uh, I was watching, somebody sent me a Chris Rock uh, not the Chris Rock, the Dave Chappelle movie the other mm. day, a Chicago cop. He said, you got to mm. watch this starting at minute 44. It was very interesting, but I watched the whole thing. And at the end, they had a music star. I think it's the guy from Haiti. I forget his name. But he was like playing a little music for in a classroom. and Everybody was sitting there adoring him. Then he, stand up and he stood up to give them advice. The piece of advice he gave them is don't blame everything on white people. And the kids are all looking at him like, what's he talking about? You know, like, why would anybody say something that stupid? Of course, it's the white <laughs> person's fault. Mm -hmm. I don't think, are you, do you think people are aware how much racial resentment and hostility there is in this country, black on white? Oh, no. no I don't think, I think the average person, uh, non-black person is completely naive as to how much uh, the politics of resentment is used as a, um, uh, a powerful tool by the, black uh, victim industry and it's it's cultivated in these kids from the earliest ages yeah all your problems your mother's pain and poverty and addictions are the result of white people most of them that end up in prison haven't even met a white person they've murdered another black person in pursuit of gaining status on the street remember now there's nobody that's going to tell them stay in school there's nobody's going to, because they're going to blame the school or blame the teacher, 
So it's the teacher's fault. It's the school's fault they don't learn. Uh, there's no stigma in the black community, none. Uh, you want to drop out of school at an early age, have at it. Nobody's going to get after you. Nobody's going to shame you. They're going to blame the system. They're going to blame the school. Um, if you're dumber than a soup sandwich, it's not your problem. It's the school's fault. So, you know, it's, it's something that's cultivated. It's a primary culture in the black community, and it's defended at every turn. And it's, uh, not, yeah. it's not like this stuff is hard to find. It, no, it's not. Hard. I mean, it's, we read it in every newspaper every day that people yeah. are doing these horrible things, mm -hmm. and we're not supposed to hold them accountable. I know. It's, it's almost like a religion. You will not hold them accountable for what they do. Uh, of course, when they get caught, you know, blowing somebody away and ended up in court and tried, convicted, sent to prison, well, they forget about that one. But the fact is it's in the course of their everyday life, the black street predator blames everybody but themselves and their mother uh, on their difficulties in life. And frankly, their difficulties aren't difficulties at all. People don't understand the black street pet. They're living a, a preferred lifestyle. This is good times for them. They, uh, they live on impulse, immediate gratification, uh, and it's considered a legitimate way to live. Any kind of delirium inducing substance they want to take, they take it. There's no shame in it because mom usually does it too. Um, it's something that they do in the, in the ghetto. The average age that I heard starting out when I worked at a prison was uh, they started smoking marijuana using it at age 11, 12 years old, some younger. But it's okay because they did it at home and mama did it. So and Anybody now, who's ever seen a Chief Keef video, uh, he's a big rapper out of Chicago yeah. that the New York mm -hmm. Times has declared as the master of the universe. There's mm -hmm. a 15-year-old kid with all of his buddies mm -hmm. doing videos and songs with nothing but guns and drugs and guns oh, yeah. and drugs. Yes, that's great status. I got a drug and I'll kill you. And uh, immolating, though, you know, setting a fire to their victims, that's not a new thing in the black community, black predator community. Uh, that's been around for years. It's just now it's made the... Well, I wanted to ask you about that. What it so I, I, you know, when I first started writing about this, I started coming across this. The first one, I said, that's weird. Second one, that's weird. Third one, that's weird. When I got to the 10th one, I started saying, what the hell's going on? A lot of people... A lot of people are being set on fire. What does that mean? Uh, that is like the ultimate status that, uh, that you are so cruel. They like to say they set them on fire while they were alive. And, and from the police reports that I've read over the years, uh, usually their victim was alive, at least to a degree, you know, not completely dead. Um, and uh, the idea is how cruel can you be? Cruelty is celebrated among black street predators. Coldness. Uh, the more innocent the victim. In other words, how in, in your research, Colin, how many have you seen elderly, murdered, just beaten to death? That is considered a status. Okay, let me, let me you know, it's fun. I, I'm sorry if we're jumping around here, but yeah. one topic I've never really taking the time to get my mind around, but I have a whole file of files, of dozens, hundreds of examples. Is this whole thing of a young black guy raping an old woman. Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand what that is. I always admit, revenge, okay, is huge among black street predators. And it's frankly huge among liberal black politicians, you know, payback. Uh, I'm entitled to something. I'm, I'm my ancestral suffering entitles me to harm you. But the ultimate outrage that they can cause the general po white population is to humiliate, which rape is a humiliating crime, uh, cr crime of humiliation, an elderly white person, and that is to enrage the white community at large. And of course, it is incredibly cruel. You have a helpless victim there, so. It's status among other black street predators. And um, there's not one soul other than conservative blacks uh, in the black community that stands up and said, uh, we have vicious uh, children that are being raised here in the black community. So and uh, we're going to find out, when's the last time you saw a mother of one of these kids being brought in front of a microphone and questioned severely by the press? Never. 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 Mm -mm. 
No, and, you won't. You have you have a lot of experience with parents coming into oh, yeah. to, to, to your world when no. their child has been arrested, apparently for no reason whatsoever. I guess that yeah. happens. does that happen a lot? A lot. Often. <laughs> the ones the chronic criminals, yeah, a lot. I mean, you'd swear by the time mama got done describing their offspring, uh, they're candidates for sainthood, you know. And of course the bottom line is, yes, yeah, my baby has done this, 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 but he wouldn't do that. You know, you yeah. just said word for word something that was said uh, two weeks ago in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. uh, a 20-year-old guy called 911. It was an ambush. This is the second, at least the second ambush I've seen in the last year. The first was in New Jersey. And that's the one Sean Bergen was brave and bold. Sean Bergen was fired mm -hmm. for calling out. Calls 911, says there's a guy running around this neighborhood with a gun. Hangs up, calls back. You better get here. He's got a gun. Cop shows up, happened to be an Asian cop. This guy who called 911 pulls the gun out, shoots the cop, the cop shoot, other cops shoot him dead. Mm -hmm. The next day, so that, 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 that day, the mother's there going, my baby, he wasn't a bad person. This one, it gets weird. I did a video on this. They mm -hmm. went, uh, members of his family tried to crash a prayer vigil for the cop. Mm -hmm. They said they were upset because people weren't praying for their son who killed the cop. And in their mind, it was all like they all both died together on the field of battle and they were somehow equal and it's some kind of crazy moral equivalence. And they actually made a big deal about it and they caused quite a ruckus and a whole room full of cops that they were upset. I mean, that seemed a little strange to me. No, no, it is. It's, they do look at their predator children as um, upstanding citizens who are just merely uh, living a preferred lifestyle and the ultimate authority is any legitimate authority who will hold them accountable for their behavior is an enemy, a legitimate enemy in their eyes. That could be a school teacher. That could be a principal or, of course, a law enforcement officer. Somebody says no to them. Then they are allowed in the black community to exercise whatever vicious response they can uh, administer at the time. And it will be defended. Yeah, I know it doesn't make any sense to the normal person, and it doesn't. However, you're not talking about normal people. You're not talking about people that have been socialized in a civilized manner. And there's a huge part of uh, the black community that is completely uncivilized. And you can quote me on it. I'll give you 20 minutes to draw a crowd. So, it's, uh, I mean, so, it's like, so every day I pick up a newspaper. And I read about this new problem. Well, the, the problem as of a few months ago was the cops were picking on black people for no reason whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But over the last month or so, now the big problem, and I saw, heard this on CBS Face the Nation with David Ignatius, a Washington Post editor. The new problem the president has to bring his attention to is this epidemic of white on black violence, apparently that is sweeping the nation. He neglected to give any examples besides Charleston. He won't be able to. He won't be able to. You might have an isolated incident, but that's it. You're not going to find the white on black epidemic anything other than uh, handouts, government handouts. Uh, you know, that's the only thing that uh, that's administered by a collection of blacks and whites. And but so, there, is, I, there I, is no assault. When I put this stuff up on YouTube, I mean, people people come in and say, hey, Colin, uh, you know, this happened, that happened. They give me one example. So I have thousands of examples. They have one example, and the one equals the thousand. So they, I don't know, is that like a public school thing? One equals a thousand, and it's, we'll just um, call it even? It's a convenient uh, logic of the uh, exploiter, okay? Uh, they know they have a population that will believe them no matter what they say. They will absolutely buy it, no matter how silly okay, it let is. Okay, let me stop there. Let me ask you this. Okay, so this is... Okay, so so the black people really believe O.J. didn't do it. Um, Is that right? Now, yeah, they, he's innocent. I mean, so they're now, not just saying this in their mind and kind of like chuckling. They got one over, and other people. So they, I mean, they really, really internalize this and believe this that these people who are convicted of crimes are not guilty. They're not guilty of it because they were driven to it. If they are, if they did do it, that means they were only driven to it due to white racism. So it, and ultimately because of that, it's not their fault. You have to understand uh, among the black community, 
anything, any rationalization, any even no matter how silly, it isn't their fault. And the perpetrator was always a good boy or girl. I mean, you know, it's it's the most it's the silliest thing you could ever see. Obviously, I'm not running for public political office, so I can say these things. But it's uh, you know, it's it borders on absolutely comedy at times. Um, yeah, I've had uh, black perpetrators stab their girlfriend six times and then sit and tell the court. And I've questioned them about it, and they've said, uh, uh, "You said that she fell against the knife." Yep. There was a I, there was a case in St. Paul yesterday. Now, if I can find a clip, I'll insert the clip here. Uh, mm -hmm. The case in St. Paul is a black man broke into a woman's apartment, lifted up mm -hmm. the window, climbed in, w w beat her up, raped her, stole her money and her and her possessions. And and mm -hmm. then um, she called the cops. Yeah, there was bruises. She was beaten. It was definitely a crime scene. They found the guy's fingerprints on mm -hmm. the window. You know, they went to his house. They, they tracked them to his house. Mm -hmm. And uh, they got there. He goes, no, it was consensual. She said she wanted to find out what it was like to have sex with a black man. Mm -hmm. and, and this, and so I wonder, and, and you know, this, this was an old woman, mm -hmm. and um, I, I just struck me that what you just, you know, when you were saying about how people make excuses and they believe them, I mean, it's, he made it almost sound credible. Oh no, really, they do. It's uh, it's like asking the guy, well, how did your girlfriend fall against the knife six times? You know, and that was that's what she did. My favorite, my, my favorite moment from the Baltimore riots is they got a Fox News reporter talking to a Baltimore city councilman. He's the guy who's married to the B state's attorney, Mosby. Mm -hmm. So they got this is like second or third night of the riots, and they're talking to this guy. And, 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 and he goes, well, m myself and some of the other men of the community, we got together and we explained the police. We have this under control, and they don't have to be here because we got it. And the Fox News reporter goes... Why are those people still rioting over there? He pointed, he pointed like over the guy's shoulder. The guy got all yeah. really unhappy at him. That's my, well, yeah. that's my favorite moment from Baltimore. Do not point out the obvious to me while I'm creating a fantasy, okay? And it's the, like they engage in this, uh, it's a shame based behavior, but they engage in this ridiculous, these most absurd comments, knowing there's nobody in the mainstream media who's going to hold them accountable. There's no, let me put it this way. How come, and I think I've asked you this before when we've been in, in our, just having our talks, why haven't you been on O'Reilly? Yeah, I mean, Bill O'Reilly has talked time and again about the racial problems and all this sort of thing, and we need more evidence of this. He had that one uh, very liberal woman on there, and she has the old retro 60s argument, uh, uh, you know, life, lifetime of repression is not their fault. And I'm thinking uh, Colin, you know, could be on here and blow a hole through this entire woman's argument. But why isn't that mainstream media have people like uh, you yourself? Know, uh, you know, I, I, get, you know I, get, I get a decent amount of coverage, but here's the thing. So I, I was on Sean Hannity. I've been on there a yeah. couple of times. I was on there a few weeks ago. I do a lot of talk radio. Uh, mm. I, but, but, you know, about a year or two ago, it really became evident that in places where I should have been, where I could mm. have added something, I wasn't yeah. going to be there. And so I decided then I was going to focus less on trying to get on Fox News and more on building up my own platform. That's why yeah. I'm constantly telling people, make sure you go on my email, go to YouTube, listen to this podcast. So I'm kind of going around the gatekeepers. We have a lot of people listening to this podcast, tens of thousands. I mean, some of my, some of my videos now get over 250,000 views. And so this yeah. is only, I've really been only been doing that part of it for a year or so. Uh, yeah. That part of it's like we don't have to worry about the gatekeepers anymore, even at Fox. Yeah, that's it's the idea. The academics they come up with these uh, equally hilarious theories on why black people commit crimes when it's it's simple. It's a simple thing. Um, I sound like John Stossel, don't I? It's a simple thing. Uh, they do it because they want to do it. It's preferred. They get incomes from the government. They uh, have a monthly stipend for this. Um, it, it's something they do. Any money they make under the table, uh, legal or le illegal, goes right into their pocket. Um, wanna, it's something wanna, they'll wanna, never wanna, be held accountable. I want to ask you about, I want to <clears> go back a little bit to the, finish up on the, the guy that we met in that uh, uh -huh. ABC News yeah. piece. Uh, what's, so you were in prison, you know, you were a prison psychologist for a long time. Yeah. What's his mm -hmm. life 
now that he's killed three white people and gone on national TV and said he's not sorry, no empathy, life's pain, get over it. That's his life world too. What's his life like in prison now? He's been there for eight years. Uh, it's pretty good uh, because he's black and he's killed white people. Uh, the ultimate status in a prison is for one of the felons to kill a law enforcement officer. That is the top priority. And now, how, those, how does how do how how does that expressed or manifest in prison? Uh, what do you mean? How is like how, how, so is how that, could how, how with respect? We, yeah, if yeah, I were if will, I were a black guy, I killed a cop, and I'm in prison. Um, how how is my how would you know that I maybe I have privileges in prison or something? Other people oh, well, just kind of kind of grant them to me. Yeah, it's, in other words, uh, the other inmates would never cause him any kind of grief. Uh, would never demand anything from him. Would never, uh, you know, um, make sure that try to bleed him for some kind of a, a pleasure um, or a good. Uh, that's just a good status thing. And of course, black felons in prison are extremely, extremely race loyal. I mean, they believe uh, race loyalty. Any any violations of uh, the black code of race loyalty, I mean, would be dealt with severely. Most people are probably. Are, you tell me. Are most people? Are aware of how segregated prisons are? Oh yeah, self-segregating big time. Yeah, I mean, black, uh, black, white, and Mexicans do not mix in these prisons. No, no, uh -uh. Mm. it's uh, they self-segregate, and if uh, even a uh, a little bit of attention is played, you know, with unless they're homosexual, then uh, they turn a blind eye. Okay, then it's well, they're gay, they're sissies, so. Uh, it's okay. But other than that, no, no. Fraternization is uh, heavily um, policed by themselves. Why are you getting so close? What do you got against the brothers? This sort of thing. Okay, so, yeah. so, I'm, and listening to, so I'm listening to NPR, and they're explaining mm -hmm. to me this morning that you know, we've got there's too many people in prison for no reason whatsoever. So based on your experience and all those years seeing all these people, uh, did we make a lot of mistakes? Are there a lot of people in there that don't belong in there? No, no, they belong there. <laughs> they absolutely belong in prison. It's like it's one of those like the old Richard Player joke, uh, Richard Pryor uh, joke at one of his stand-ups when he visited prison. He said, "Thank God we have prisons." You know, it's I was just thinking that <laughs> I got to find that. Yeah. Bit. I'll put it in right here. Do you remember? That's really. I mean, yeah. Well, thank God yeah. we have penitentiaries. He said, um, because it's what the first thing would strike you among a black. A predator who's doing time, you know, is how calmly and cool they are about what they did. And what do you think of your victim? And they'll look at you like, what about him? <laughs> you know? But here's the uh, thing. The people mm -hmm. on the outside, mm -hmm. they don't think of the victim any more than the predator thinks of Absolutely. the victim. The focus is on the predator and in a positive way. I mean, I tell people they want to know, and like any NPR reporter, Go through a black community, and you will notice things you will never notice in a non-black community. And that is bars on windows, a convenience stores with little turnstiles with plexiglass, bulletproof uh, a plexiglass all over the place. You'll see no, this. I, I can speak to the convenience stores. That's because the Asian shopkeepers are ripping off black people. I happen that's to know it. That I'm telling fact. you. It's, it's horrible. So That's, uh, a, that's an article of faith there, is it not? Yeah, well, that's they'll just accept it that the Asian shopkeepers are ripping them off. Which is then, if you ask, well, why don't so why don't a black person open a shop there? Then it's mm -hmm. like then there's then we get crickets. Well, yeah, dead silence. Of course, of course, it's like uh, the, you know in Detroit, there's no national chain hasn't been for years of a grocery store supermarket. Uh, it just costs too much money. The security, the theft, uh, the shopping carts, their posts put in. Just outside the entrance, in the cemented in the ground, so you can't you can't get a shopping cart past the entrance because the shopping carts are a couple hundred bucks a pop and they end up disappearing. They take them. You know that, of course, is like a big national issue, right? They talk about food deserts. Same with bank, you know, bank branches <laughs> in the in the ghetto. It's and what it, it's black all, people it, have done. And, and um, you know, a, a year ago, Trader Joe's wanted to put a Trader Joe's in Portland. In the mm -hmm. ghetto. Yes. And they didn't do it for business reasons. Listen, they did it because, 
you know, somebody wanted, said, hey, why don't you do that? We'll pat you on the back and we'll give you some other goodies on some other level. So they go in there. First thing you know, there's like 20 black people saying, we don't want Trader Joe's in here because they only cater to white people. We'd yeah. rather have public housing. I swear I heard it from Trader yeah. Joe's headquarters. I swear you heard this like collective sigh of relief going, man, we didn't want to be there anyway. No, exactly. Because they don't sell a products. They don't sell products that black people in the ghetto uh, prefer. And really, it's the uh, there's a black diet in the ghetto, and a lot of blacks make fun of whites because we don't eat that stuff. You know, chitlins and fat packs and all that sort of thing. It's just not done. So uh, you'll have independent grocers that will sell it, and of course they can buy it with uh, EBT cards, this sort of thing. But a Trader Joe's. Oh, you're a grain fred trout. I mean, really? Come on. I mean, they're gonna they're going to spend that much money on a fish that ate grains. You know, in a in Atlanta yesterday, there was um, you know, a lot of times you learn on these news reports and the parenthetical comments. In mm -hmm. Atlanta, there was hundreds and hundreds of black people. They didn't say that, but it was at, on, on ATVs rampaging through the city, breaking traffic laws, going the wrong way down a one-way street, all this stuff. But the cops, the reporter comes out and says, the police say they cannot chase them. Well, it's not cannot, they will not. Will not, yes. And I was talking to a city council member in one of these East Coast cities, you know, chocolate cities. And this mm -hmm. council member said every drug dealer has a dirt bike or an ATV mm -hmm. because in the middle of a transaction, if something goes wrong, they hop on their bike and they're gone. And they will mm -hmm. not be pursued. Yes. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, they're not idiots. They just know what will happen, what won't happen. The, and blacks in the inner city know and when they have a mob and do something in a mob form, the chances of them getting caught and held responsible are slim and none. So it's done because, again, in take city like Detroit, that's an area of stigma-free living. Nothing is wrong that you do there. Anything you do, if you decide you want to live off the government, nothing wrong with that. That's legitimate. If you steal things and bring things home you've stolen, nothing wrong with that. This is what you do. Um, smoke dope at an early age and all your life, nothing wrong with that. We smoke dope in this You know, can we talk about that, that one canard? That whenever you see the the crowd that wants to let people out of prison, they always latch on uh, to one thing, which is white people, black people commit the same amount of crime. Everybody knows that, except poli white police are picking on black people. That's the only reason why so many end up in jail. Mm -hmm. And they always use the example of black people, white people smoke the same amount of pot. We've talked about that. I've written about that. Total mm -hmm. fiction. Johns it Hopkins is. proved it. Journal of Addictive Behavior. Many, many studies about the self-reporting. Mm -hmm. The rate of drug use. I mean, in your experience, if somebody tells you white people and black people are using drugs in the same amount, what's your reaction to that? That's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, drug use in the black community is accepted. It's common. It's later on they can complain about it. Mama was uh, you know, my mama's crack. I had crackhead. This sort of thing. They can complain about it to get sympathy from a social worker. I mean, social workers are the easiest uh, government people to bleed for sympathy. And um, all they have to do is tell them a little tale of woe and tell them that, uh, you know, their mama was high on crack and they'll usually give a lot of consideration to them. And, and as a social worker, not to indict a whole profession, but most social workers I've run into will believe anything as long as they don't have to hold uh, the perpetrator accountable for their behavior. So now, let me, okay, let's talk about that. So you, you were yeah. you were in the prison system with all these social workers. Mm -hmm. it seems like some of the people I met, from cops to social workers, I swear, I I I, I, I swear they're suffering from PTSD. Oh yeah, yeah. It's just you can you can take so much for it, then you you do have to take a break because the constant barrage of absolute antisocial, for want of a better term, behavior. It's just you go home and you shake your head and it's like no, oh, you just want to. You know, hug your spouse and <laughs> have a good meal because you ju your kids can't fathom this lifestyle of complete. Uh, it's actually, I think I've told you this before on one of our previous podcasts. Uh, these perpetrators, they have the emotional maturity level of a pre adolescent between ages eight and 12 years old, inclusive. You know what? This is really interesting. Could you kind of work, walk me through what welfare dependency has to do with what you just said? Yeah, welfare dependency, it's infantilizing. 
Infantilizing is when you never hold somebody accountable for their behavior. They become accustomed to living in that age level that has paid them a dividend. So if I have never developed a work ethic and I've lived, uh, you know, as a dependent of uh, the government and dependent of uh, government services, it pays for you to stay irresponsible. It pays for you to lay on the couch all day. It pays for you to blame other people and fall apart when life's little difficulties get a little bit tough. Now, it Marlon, pays. I heard the president say two weeks ago in Charleston mm -hmm. that the only reason for black unemployment, or the big reason, is not what you just said. It's mm -hmm. because of this unconscious racism that allows somebody to call Johnny back for a job interview, but not mm -hmm. Jamal. Mm -hmm. And so one of you guys has got it wrong. Yeah, well, the president's got it wrong. <laughs> I mean, a black street predator, if you stuck him in a barrel and rolled him to a job, he's not going to work. Regular work is for saps. Okay, It's for idiots. It's for fools. Regular get up in the morning, work for you know minimum wage. They can't understand or wrap their head around the fact you build yourself up into a profession. You learn a trade. You learn this. That no, they do not. They're pre-adolescent. They can't think that far ahead. They're not able to because they've never been held accountable at school, at home, anywhere. It's always been somebody else's fault. So as long as they keep acting up, the federal and state cash will flow into the ghetto. And now so we have an old army of people that seems to be growing. Mm -hmm. That seems to be reinforcing that whole attitude they didn't do anything they're never guilty of anything and all the reason only reason they're in prison is because white cops don't like them what, what are the consequences of that infantilizing it again it's if you don't hold them accountable they learn to stay a child and they never have to feel any sort of pang of guilt for any shameful behavior uh, which there is no shameful behavior in the ghetto uh, they don't have to own up to it. It's always somebody else's fault. You know, I, I did it's a, the I did single a, most infantilizing thing you could do to any population. I did a uh, story for American Thinker this week, and it talked about how when the pre in 2004, do you remember that speech where Obama burst on the scene? He gave a speech to the Democratic National Convention. He he, he talked about how we've got to put an end to this lie that just because a black person studies, they're acting white. And then he talked about how just because they gave me a funny name, Barack, he's talking about himself. That doesn't mean I couldn't succeed. Then we flash forward 11 years later to Charleston. Everything's different now. The name mm. means you're going to be subject to racism. Yeah. And if you're in school, you're not doing well in school. It's not because mm. of the culture in the school. It's because of the culture of white racism. That mm. doesn't, it's not giving you a proper education. That's right. Well, self-pity <clears throat> is their powers, you know, um, put, pushing the old idea that all their troubles again, stem from white people, they get, they get power they're, you know, from that sort of thing. All they need is a willfully ignorant population to believe it. And they have one ready-made right there. So it's the idea is I'm in power and among the black citizen, majority of them, our people are in charge now. So that's a good thing regardless of what their people in charge are doing, and no matter how corrupt they are, they, they just take the attitude, uh, black people are in charge, so it's a good thing. Um, you'd say, well, what I would like to have is uh, have a black politician deregulate, get rid of regulations, uh, put criminals away that harm innocent black people, and uh, start uh, weeding out... Uh, students who want to be in school and don't want to be in school and hold everybody accountable, that black politician is not going to go far at all, if anywhere. It's the one that's going to make the excuse, and it's the one that's killing, literally at times, the black population. It's, hard, it's really hard to overstate how widespread that is. It is. It's epidemic. I mean, come on. It's it's all over. It's not your fault. There's nothing worse than it's, as a psychologist, as a therapist, one of the first things that you have to work at is get your client, as they're called now, your patient, to accept responsibility for every choice they've made. Yeah, but I didn't do nothing. And that's just it. <clears throat> when they find out that their choices got them in life, that's when the real power and the real cure begins. 
with a patient in therapy. You know, not just patients in therapy, everybody listening to this podcast, right? Yeah, Once exactly. you make the decision that you are 100% responsible for everything that happens in your life, at first blush, it's like, oh, that sounds like a lot of work. But at second mm -hmm. blush is, well, if I'm, if I'm in charge, I guess I can change it. Yeah, you can change it. Absolutely. And that's when you finally realize, I'm not going to pick these partners that are damaging. I'm not going to uh, use drugs and alcohol anymore. I'm not going to do this. Um, do you have a, live a high-risk lifestyle? When you wrap your head around the fact you make high-risk choices in everything you do and you end up in the toilet, uh, you stop doing it. Then you realize, wait a minute, regardless of what happened to me growing up, uh, it's my choice now. It's adult time. And adult time says I'm responsible for every choice I make. Now, in, in, uh, in prison, do people ever figure that out? Uh, some, yes. Yeah, some of us like, wait a minute. I'm here for the reason is because of what I did. And it's that simple. And when you're talking to people, you weren't giving them the pat them on the head, poor little, poor, what was you? Oh, no. You were giving uh, them the, uh, the 82nd Airborne Paratrooper tough love oh, yeah. approach. That's right. That was like... You know, who, who you give me a break, okay? I mean, I was born, but not yesterday. And uh, the fact is, the reason you're here is for what you did. And once in a while, they'll say it. That you'll, you'll run into somebody, black, white, and that it'll just hit them. And they'll even pick up on the emotional immaturity slant of it. And one of them, I can remember one told me, he said, being in prison is like being sentenced to a middle school with all the little... Uh, you know, backstabbing and the gossip and the childishness and the, uh, I said, narcissism. I teach them what that's all about. Narcissism is rampant in the black community. This uh, self-love that's pathological. I mean, really, it's, uh, you know, they when believe you talk about narcissism, whenever I listen to an Obama speech, how many <laughs> times do we hear the word I in the speech? And something is only good or bad when it's related personally to him. Trayvon exactly. Martin could have been my son. Yeah, you know, this it's all and, and I, I. It's really kind of weird to me. That's the narcissism. That is. It's also narcissism is also when somebody says something you disagree with and you've got to harm them because of what they said. Uh, how many times have people called you racist for your for just the kind of work you're doing, uh, even though you're not a racist? But the fact is, you said something they disagree with, so I've got to hurt you. You know, let's talk about that 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 instinct for a minute because mm -hmm. I find that kind of rub you know rampant. Not just when you talk, especially when you talk about race, but I mm -hmm. find it's really a liberal impulse, right? It's a bull. Isn't it kind of a bullying thing? It's like oh, I'll it say two plus two equals four, and they'll mm -hmm. they'll mock you or scorn you and, mm -hmm. and and insist two plus two equals five, and everybody says yes, yeah, 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 it is, yeah, it is. So it's really kind of what's I don't understand why this uh, detach where they get this like detachment from reality and why they're so invested in these delusions. Oh, because you know it pays them dividends. It's how they can keep their stability. You know the basic human defenses: denial, rationalization. Um, you know these this sort of thing. Well, they sort of uh, narcissists get into it big time. They'll intellectualize anything, rationalize anything. Um, they will deny the reality sitting right in the things are too much psychologically to tolerate. Then they just block it out and say it just didn't happen. There was a, there was an yeah. episode uh, that was in the newspaper this week about a teacher, black teacher who was explaining to a white student. I think they captured this on video. I'm not sure. She was explaining to, 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 to him how much she hated having to teach him and kind of, talk to him and take care of him in school because of all the bad things white people have done to quote her people what the hell is that all about oh i don't know it's like it um you know the fact is one of the things that narcissists like to say is you'll never understand me <laughs> you know is this a is this a a variation of it's a black thing you wouldn't it's understand? a it's a black thing correct that's the variation and you know they're all there. They get really angry to say, "I'm sorry, but you are understandable. I can easily figure you out." Okay, it's is not. You're not a puzzle. You're not complicated. I mean that that's kind of the that's kind of the question I had is that now the big big the only explanation for any disparity between white people and black people is white racism. Mm -hmm. Totally taken psycho. It's like we've taken psychology off the table 
and mm-hmm. just said it's not relevant anymore. It's all about these bad white people. Yeah, yeah. It uh, that way that ends the discussion. Uh, that way they don't have to own up to anything. It's you understand when you stop and think that the federal government has all the so-called brainy people on the planet uh, willing to be at their disposal to get an honest theory. Uh, well, because most psychologists follow the collective narrative that it's going to be somebody else's fault, even though all research, is, research over the years has proven it completely different uh, you know, from that. Every, co- every, college, every college campus in America has hundreds and hundreds of people, usually on, connected to the faculty. Every black yeah. newspaper, every major newspaper has people yeah. on the staff. That were, if they were listening mm-hmm. to this conversation right now, they would challenge us and say, well, Colin and Marlon, you don't want to take responsibility for 400 years of white oppression against black people. So it's your problem with responsibility, not mine yeah i would tell that person no i don't take responsibility for other people's behavior okay so you're no no fun i am a buzzkill when it comes to the uh pms crowd poor me syndrome uh crowd so um it's funny there was a there was a a college professor they she she blamed white people for her for her menstrual problems oh sure (laughs) she blamed white people for pms the real pms yeah it's uh it, remember I told you this, this, this blaming uh, and damning, the basis for all emotional instability is blaming and damning, by the way. And it, say, it, that, say that again. Blaming and damning others, that's the basis for all emotional instability. Wow. Blaming and damning, yeah, you can take that to the bank. Okay? Uh, that's Albert Ellis. All the research he did, he died when he was 90-some years old. And Two words. Um, yeah, blaming and damning. That will destroy you if, if you engage in it on a chronic basis. But, um, and, but that's a religion in the black community. And that's why you see black people uh, turn violent in the drop of a hat because it's been legitimized by their handlers, by the NPR people, uh, by the people in the victim industry, black victim industry. Uh, you, they're never going to be held accountable for what they do. They can fall apart. It's not their fault. And they're troubled. And they are, you know, feeling, uh, it's all feelings. Yeah. Let, let me like ask a, you this. So I want to, let's, let's, let me just, uh, I'm outside on my porch smoking a cigar. So if you hear a helicopter go by, that is why. All right. Um, but, um, you know, on my, on my YouTube channel, I get anywhere between 25 and 50,000 comments a month. I get a lot on my Facebook channel, a lot, Twitter, a lot of email too. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a nice, there's a good chunk of it comes from, from white nationalists, white supremacists, people mm. who, who really think that the answer to this hyper racial worldview that many black people and black leaders have is to compete with that worldview with a similar white view of the world. Does that make, does that make any more sense? No, to no, it's that, of course not. Of course, it's the two rugs make a right thing you know uh, it's uh no the idea of the white supremacist thing that's nonsense they're just as pathological as the black ones who do it and frankly there's black supremacists i mean that they uh that's where the comedy really gets interesting because they make up uh you know the pyramids were built by blacks and that's Kemet. That's everything Kemet to, that's Kemet to you yeah it's uh no no it's when you get these people that try to appeal to you and say White supremacy is the, you know. Here's the thing. Is so I met, you know, I, I read these people's comments, the white supremacists, the white uh, separatists, the white segregationists. Mm-hmm. They don't seem very superior to me. That's like the big flaw in the argument. But they, <laughs> they don't. They seem kind of it's, below average. Yeah, they don't. It's like it's something they want to adopt an attitude of superiority. It's and they're like, easily found out. They're and, easily seen through. So you know, when you and I talk, I mean, you you have. I mean, it seems like a psychological psychological point of view would almost be kind of a libertarian point of view, which is, you know, what I expect you to take me as you find me. I'll take you as I find you, and I'm mm. not gonna I'm not gonna be a part of a. I'm not, I don't I don't want you to think of me as a group. I'm just a person here, and, and sure. I'll take 100 percent responsibility for everything I'm doing here. That seems yeah. like a libertarian thing. It is pretty libertarian. It is, except the person as they are. But and, they and, and, and the big them. evil, to me, whether it's white supremacy or this uh, this black mob violence that I write about. Hold on one second. Thing. 
Okay, I'm back. Anyway, so to me, from a liber- kind of a liber- quasi-libertarian point of view, uh-huh. all this talk about this, this talk, this black racial consciousness that is so rampant mm-hmm. is really kind of an evil thing just because it is a collectivist thing. And so it is, is the white it's- supremacy thing. I mean, I see these people going around saying, we, you know, white people got to do this, white people got to do that. Mm-hmm. It's goofy to me. Oh, it is goofy. I mean, come on. White people don't do anything other than vote for the candidate that's going to push the idea of individual responsibility. And there are plenty of black people out there that also believe in individual responsibility. You know, pulling your own weight, taking care of yourselves, being responsible for your behavior. But now we got Rand Paul and a couple of, actually a couple of other Republican candidates for president have kind of signed into this idea of ma- the buzzword is mass incarceration. Mm-hmm. Tons and tons of black people who are in prison for no reason whatsoever. Mm-hmm. And um, it's kind of mystifying to me. Uh, well, it's just an easy way and a lazy way to go at it. Okay, The idea is the big, huge, gigantic mistake they make is assuming that racial groups all behave the same. Uh, they do. They believe Politicians believe that. The reality is there's performance level and socialization levels that are different among racial groups. The Asians adapt best just about to any environment you can think of. They excel no matter what they do. It has to do with their personal discipline, their uh, personal uh, rules for achievement, uh, their desire to be compatible with the society they live in. Consequently, they uh, are extremely low in the uh, incarceration population. Okay, the uh, the same thing with uh, Jews. You know, there's very very few Jews that are incarcerated. Okay, the fact is. Uh, get along with it, work with the system, excel academically or professionally. Um, and uh, What I'm astonished at is roots. how many people reject what you said, the, reject the whole idea that a person who plays by the rules, excels, studies, mm-hmm. does good things. I mean, there's no place for that person now because it's all about this collective thing it that is. you're talking it is. about. It's the socialist mindset, even among people who claim to be libertarians, you know. Uh, but they will say, you know, we all perform the same. No, we don't. Uh, the fact is certain uh, groups and certain races perform at different levels. Uh, IQ is, is not allowed to be discussed, as you probably already know, by some researchers because uh, if they mention that there's a large portion of the black community that has a below average IQ, they are fired, vilified, attacked. Okay, let me throw let me throw out let me throw a contrasting point of view on the IQ thing in here. Yeah. Um okay, so IQ I know I don't doubt that it measures a certain kind of intelligence. I also mm-hmm. know there's a lot of different kinds of intelligence. And if you stick somebody yeah. with a low IQ in a college, that's and teach them to, to major in black studies, that's like a guaranteed road block, road pathway for failure. But if oh, you, yeah. I think are these people that have, maybe their IQs aren't, you know, or, or average or below average, I think these, I think a lot of people have skills that we just have to figure out what they are. Does that make me yeah. naive to say that? No, no, that's just it. There's skills. There's different kinds of intelligence. There's different kinds of skills. Uh, the idea that everybody's got to go to college to make it in this world is baloney. Uh, the the idea that uh, you might be blue collar, you develop a skilled trade, you're going to make a very good living all your life. Uh, be a mechanic, plumber, electrician, that sort of thing, <laughs> you're going to make a very good living. I mean, there's not a lot of status. When some people look for status, uh, the bigger the ego, the greater need for status, this sort of thing. But um, the fact is there is there are different levels of uh, success and intel- intelligence. So it's what you do with what you have is where you end up. So we round up all these these black kids, we put them mm-hmm. in colleges. We may, we we herd them into black studies programs, mm-hmm. where they all they're taught is racial grievance and Grieve, how, yeah. how black yeah. people are relentless victims of relentless right. white racism all the time. Everywhere that explains everything, especially why cops are always picking on black people for no mm-hmm. reason whatsoever. That's yeah. a script, and they, everybody it knows this, learns the script in ten minutes. They just they just keep repeating that every mm-hmm. every twenty minutes for the next four years of their college career. I, I look at uh, gender studies and uh, race studies in college. I just lump them all into one category, resentment studies. And if anything is going to destabilize anybody, it's cultivating resentment in them. 
would you call so it blaming and damning? Blaming and damning. That's it. That's the basis for all emotional instability. And um, it's how they can come up. What was that sociology professor that said that white people are demons? This sort of thing. It's like it doesn't get any more. It's, like I said, this stuff's comedic. I mean, she got fired. I don't know what university she was from. But it was like uh, she has been immersed in uh, the victim uh, uh, religion of uh, you know America and the one that's not questioned by the mainstream media and by the liberals in Congress. So you know we're not we're not really asking reporters to do much. No, all I, I ask them to do is when somebody says something like that, just to, just somebody makes a really crazy statement about race and crime, and just mm -hmm. go really. Because I find if you ask somebody a question, one or two questions, um, everything starts to fall apart very quickly. Oh, sure. Yeah. It's like the old thing is, how do you know what you know? Okay. All white people are the devil. Uh, you're an academic. You're not supposed to believe in devils. So could you explain on that? How, what, what is the problem? How did you get where you are, a uh, professor at a university, uh, if white people are bad? How did a black man become president if uh, white people are terrible. I mean, come on. <laughs> They're just reality alone blows our argument right out of the water. But we have a very indulgent mainstream media and a very indulgent part of our Congresses, our Congress, uh, Congresses at the state and federal level that will believe them. Willful Let me ignorance. Ask you this. Do you see any um, green shoots out there? that people seem to be kind of like running out of patience with this whole racial paradigm. And they're really kind of eager just to get into a place where everybody takes responsibility for their own stuff and, and gets rid of the blaming and the damning. Well, you know, I haven't seen a lot of that, but uh, they, that kind of person doesn't really get much airtime anywhere. But personally, yeah, I see people are just, they're so sick and tired of it. Um, now it's just who's going to be the, uh, the latest victim that we can elevate. Look at Bobby Jindal. He's Indian born. Um, and uh, he was criticized for not uh, falling into the race game. He's perfectly uh, uh, at home with the personal responsibility school of thought. Consequently, he's very successful and uh, he's very effective and he's a nice man. <laughs> you know, on but, CBS, uh, su the Sunday morning talking head show last week and a half ago, Mm -hmm. They had three people who were nominally Republicans on at various parts of the show. They had uh, Michael Gerson, a former Bush speechwriter. They had Hugh Hewitt, a conservative talk show host out in your neck of the woods, L.A., Orange County. And they had um, David Brooks, who's nominally the Republican, you know, Republican columnist at the New York Times. All yeah. three of them at different parts of the show totally bought into this whole idea that there's an enormous amount of white racism and black people are relentless victims of it all the time, everywhere, and gosh darn it, what are we going to do about it? Because now it's turning violent. Yeah, all I would ask is, I would ask them, where is the racism? That's it. Give me examples. It's like the people that have told you recently tremendous amount of white on black violence. Give me some examples. They can't. Well, the, you know, of course, now, now it's all one word, right? It's Charleston. Oh, yeah. Yeah, one incident. It's like the reasoning of a child. I mean, there's no uh, serious academic that would even look at that, sort of, let alone a lawyer, uh, look at that as one incident. Does an epidemic make? Hardly. I mean, come on. It's just, let's get... You know, one of the things I write about in my book, I think that might have been one of the chapters where you're not all over it. And I just kind of reproduce all these academic, bogus academic studies. Hold on one second. Mm -hmm. These are studies that end up on the front page of the New York Times, Washington Post. And they become part of the, the, the jargon on all the talking heads shows. Mm -hmm. But if you read the study, and, and uh, you, it's never in the executive summary, but if you keep looking at the footnotes, you find something completely bogus. Like oftentimes they're talking about self-reported behavior. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's just weird how like this industry is out there to show that there's an enormous amount of white racism. They do it in lab studies. They do it other places. But it's, you know, out here in the real world, we're all just trying to make it based on our own talents, on our own abilities. And... Um, 
There's a lot, white people in this country are not the, 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 the predators. They are the victims of racial resentment, and especially cops. Yeah, because they don't fight back. There's no real backlash, and, and they know it. It's the same way. It's like, would you go after a Muslim or a Christian if you didn't like their religion? Well, who's going to hurt you? The Muslim will. You know, it's funny how all these people are so brave about trashing Christians, you know, but, you know, what you said is so true. Yeah, it is. It's like, you know, they're not going to hurt you. So go after them. That way you can elevate yourself at the expense of others, the the logic of a child. And then you can, uh, you know, of course, get airtime and your ego can be fed. And you can create this fantasy of uh, persecution. And uh, that's what I call them, persecution fantasies. Uh, it seems like the ones that spout them off the most are the wealthiest black people. Um, the That's weird. Black, black rappers are the, are the best at it. They're hilarious. So uh, I'm sorry I don't keep up with the names of these guys, but um, they can sit there and say, you know, uh, P. Diddy or something later. I said the reason that blacks aren't making it, I could have the wrong rapper, so forgive me. But there's black McKin- and the guy's like a multimillionaire a few time, dozen times over. Uh, you know, it has all the choices in life he wants, and he's complaining. It doesn't make any sense. The evidence is overwhelming, as the lawyers would say, against them. You know, I get a lot of uh, I get a lot of email, and my next book is going to be a compilation of letters from people who have been the victims mm-hmm. of uh, black on white crime, black on white violence, black mob violence. A mm-hmm. lot of a, a lot of stuff happening in schools. Oh yeah, right. Well, look at the whole religion of black victimhood, uh, imaginary black victimhood. Look what happened when the one Philadelphia newspaper wrote being white in Philadelphia. Yeah, Philadelphia magazine, yeah. Oh, my Lord. I mean, it was just all the, uh, the entire city, black city government, which is all black, went into action wanting uh, explanations. and. The mayor said he was going to take it to the Human Relations Commission. Oh, but his, yeah. But here's right. how that story, do you remember how that story kind of ended? One, a friend of a mutual friend of ours, Talib Starks, Ty Starks, yeah. who wrote a book called The Uncivil War, which everybody yeah. should read if they haven't. He was mm-hmm. at that meeting, and and here's how the here's what I didn't like about how the story ended. They had the, the the editor, publisher of the magazine, and the reporter in a room with a whole bunch of black people calling him names for writing this story about how yeah. white people in Philadelphia are under constant threat of racial violence. Mm-hmm. They kind of like. They kind of tucked their tails a little bit. Oh, well, they went fetal. I mean, yeah, it was yeah. like uh, the, the editor of the paper went, you know, into grovel status. It's like, good. You know, the old airborne paratrooper came up and said, grow up here, mister. You know, I mean, for crying out loud, all he did was get commentary. It did, and if anybody's read that story, it's pretty pretty much a puff piece. You know, so it's here's the thing. Puff. So these big cities that you, you even smaller yeah. cities now, this mm-hmm. whole idea of uh, of no go zones. This whole idea, like in a place where I am right now, Wilmington, Delaware, the the whole atmosphere of race is very thick, very prevalent, and uh, everybody kind of knows where a white person can go when they can go there. I mean, Joe sure. Biden wrote about this in his autobiography. I did a podcast on it, and but it seems like nobody wants to acknowledge this whole racial and crime thing is really, really thick in the air and and if you do people get they yell at you me i don't care i mean i just say it and you know the way i tell you okay here's here's something here's how i kind of stay out of yeah well it interrupts I, I i stay out of jam by just talking about facts people yeah. i find that people that read my stuff and listen to you mm-hmm. they're very un not used to talking about race and so when they do it's kind of awkward they feel like they have to come up with this big cause this big solution. yeah right that's yeah. not their world. I say, listen, unless you're Marlon Newburn, why are you telling me about psychology? Why are you telling me about theology, sociology, psychology, mm-hmm. every ology in the world? And, you know, these guys are carpenters, plumbers, you know, whatever. They don't know anything <laughs> about this. It sounds weird. And they're, all of a sudden, everybody is off the topic of which, which we started on, which is this enormous level of black mob violence, black on white crime that exists mm-hmm. that's ruining all these cities. And mm-hmm. but some, let me ask. So so I get I get a lot of people that really want to know, like, okay, what can I do? And how, how do how does an average person kind of how do they decide how to how they're going to live in this world where, where we have these 
persecution fantasies, these delusions that, mm -hmm. that are every part of our everyday life. I mean, it kind of bugs a lot of people. Yeah, it's, you know, just be honest at all times. Don't back down when somebody sits and blames you for something you didn't do. I mean, that's where things get really stupid, uh, really crazy. But, you know, they're, they're gonna, people are going to have to learn to just go ahead and stand up and say, look, you're lying, you're wrong, you know, um, and don't accept anything that you didn't do. Um, and take, it, take the mainstream media with a grain of salt. I mean, they're singing a narrative that isn't true. Black people in the past 50 years since Johnson came out with his um, what was the name of the program? The uh, poverty, the Great Society. The, uh, on, the Great Society. There's been programs specific <clears throat> for black people, set asides, preferences. I mean, admissions in colleges and jobs, uh, promotions, and affirmative action where somebody else is victimized just so a race can be elevated above them, blacks can be elevated. This has been going on 50 years, and look what you have now more racial resentment than ever. So it's like it doesn't work. You cannot single somebody out for preferential treatment and expect them to um, all of a sudden overnight become a, a civilized group. But if you ask now, any, any of the liberals, and you know what? I need, I'm sorry to say this, a lot of conservative, too many conservatives and Republicans, their attitude is, well, I guess we have to give it another 50 years. Yeah, I know. They do. It do. It's like... All right, that didn't work for 50 years. Let's take another more. shot. The only solution? More and longer. Yeah, it's like... It, it's it's, 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 it seems like it's almost... It seems like there's just a lot of insanity surround, yeah. it's, it's surrounding this topic, and, and there's so much secrecy. My guess is psychologically the secrecy kind of... If I said secrecy breeds this kind of insanity and sickness, would I be too far off the mark? Uh, yeah. No, you wouldn't be very far off the mark. The idea is I want to be looked... That is nice and kind and loving. And if I say something that doesn't, you know, to a preferred protected group that isn't flattering or isn't agreeable to them, I'm not nice. <laughs> so Man, I, see, so, I see so much of that. I see so yeah. much of that on my YouTube page. Oh yeah. What is that yeah. about somebody that really makes really they, they really just need to be seen as a as, as a morally superior person? They do. It's like that's narcissism again. That pops up and say, I'm above all this. I know the meaning of life and I know how to uh, end all these problems, this sort of thing, in a very painless and easy way, which of course is nonsense. Um, the fact is, you have to call things out. You, call, you have to recognize evil for what it is and call it that. Um, that's another thing, especially academics. They do not like to recognize the concept of evil. You know, the, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a particularly religious person, but even I know in the good book, it says something like, you know, the worst thing you can do is to call good, bad and bad. Good. Oh, absolutely. That's in the book of Isaiah, I believe. Oh, yeah. nice. Pull the religion yeah. card on me. Nice. Yeah. I'm telling you. And it's like, uh, evil is the absence of empathy. If you want a definition, Wow. the absence of empathy. Okay. That's what we saw yeah, on the. Uh, that's what we saw on the um, uh, on the audio, the clip to open this segment. Yeah, right. Yeah, and it's a complete absence of empathy. That's evil. And uh, when I taught at Lake Superior State University for a while, uh, I, you know, uh, part time, and I just uh, explained to them there is a concept of evil. You, these young and budding psychologists who took my classes, and I tell them after the absence of empathy and. Uh, so there's where you're going to find your definition of evil. Okay, you and, know what? Let's let's kind of since I've been ha I've had you on the phone here for a long time. Let's yeah. uh, let's get people up to speed on what you're doing now. So you recently had a big move in your life. You're now you've gone from uh, Michigan and gone from Detroit. You, you have a Detroit area where you're born and raised. Went to college yeah. in Vietnam. Then uh, you did mm -hmm. this prison thing. Then you were up there in the Upper Peninsula partying with your Harley oh, yeah. Davidsons and your college <laughs> students. Yeah. Now, what, and so something recently happened. Oh, yeah, I got married and I moved to Los Angeles. So. Did you get married? I didn't know, the, I didn't hear the married part. Oh, yeah, I got married. Yeah, I'm, I'm street legal now, so uh, you bet. So I'm legit. When did you, uh, tell, oh, tell us about, you know, I think some of the listeners to this podcast may uh, recognize the name of your lovely bride because she's quite a articulate and important person in her corner of the universe. Oh, she, yes, uh, we're sort of like uh, two peas in a pod, Nani Darwish. Um, she's uh, Egyptian-born, 
She's written several books on uh, Islam and the dangers therein. Uh, she's spoken all over the world uh, as far as the dangers of radical tell, tell Islam. Us, tell, 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 it's non, how do you spell her last name? Dar Darwish? Darwish, yes. D-A-R-W-I-S-H. So what's her latest book? Um, uh, the latest one, boy, there's four okay. of them. So. Okay, well, give us the most popular and, one. Well, one of them is uh, Cruel and Usual Punishment. Now, let me yeah. ask you this. Now, you've taught, we, we ought to get, you know what, we ought to have Nani on for this. We'll get her on here with yeah. one of these days. But it, do you see any connection between how everybody re reacts to these horrific acts of Islamic terrorism around the world and how people react to black on white crime and black mob oh, violence here? Amazing similarities. Just amazing. It's a whole psychological construct, uh, the similarities between the two. I mean, really it is. It's, uh, it almost seems to me like sometimes it's like, not even similar. It's 100% yeah. the same, right down to it the is, molecule. Right down to the same, making excuses, uh, trying to say it's isolated, it's not common. Ignoring it, wishing it away, it, denying. I am sure, making excuses. Excusing. And of course, uh, that's, uh, they've already started here. Muslims who have moved to America, they're insulted now. They're trying to adopt the victim you know, victimhood that uh, so many uh, black leaders have uh, done with their population. So it's, it's just absolutely the same archetype, as Jung would call it, is, uh, you know, the profile is they're trying to start the same thing and do the same thing. They're explaining away the viciousness, the violence, uh, explaining away that it's an isolated incident when it's precisely the same. So it's, uh, it's, um, uh, pretty staggering as far as when you see the parallels. Well, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad, Mrs. New. Yeah, there's a new Mrs. Mrs. Newburn on the scene to keep you in line now. <laughs> oh, there has to civilize. She has civilizing. <laughs> she's smarter than I, I am, and certainly better looking. So. That's psychology. Yeah, she's she's a good. She's a very very attractive lady. I've seen many pictures is. of it, and all I could say is, man, why is it the psychologists get all the girls? <laughs> I just lucked out. <laughs> I was blessed. So. Yep, she's uh, uh, intellectually, she's a powerhouse. You know so. what? Why don't we do this? Uh, next time we do this, we'll figure out a way to put both of you on a microphone, and we'll do a three-way Skype thing. And because uh, I would really like to hear her talk about her stuff, and we can kind of draw it all together into a big picture. Let's do that. Let's do that. Yeah, we okay, can do see, that. You're up, so you're 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 getting licensed to practice psychology in uh, yeah we're going uh, through the bureaucratic hoops to get licensed you're, out in you're out in the northern suburbs of LA correct would you yes. how you would describe it? that's where all the right. swells live I'll tell you yep. something <laughs> listen I've talked to you so much and uh you know you're the, the idea that you could bring a practice to that area uh, kind of give them a tough love approach like don't give mm -hmm. me any of the new age bs because that's like you know the really you know you probably figured this out by now the new age thing is so huge out there oh yeah and, oh yeah i mean isn't that kind of another way of kind of evading responsibility in a way of course it is yeah of course it is yeah let's let's not look at reality let's create a fantasy and build around it so you know isn't yeah. that i mean but isn't that kind of like every psych i mean a lot of people that's kind of like they consider it an annuity which is they get these clients and they never confront them with what responsibility they have in their yeah. own in their own business, and mm -hmm. it just goes on for years and years and years, and it's like a it's like a bad talk radio show. Well, it is, yeah, and of course that uh, it's very lucrative for the psychologist, and as they exploit the uh, the client, see you that's know, why you're going to be that's why you're going to be huge out there. And if anybody listening to this has any screwed up relatives out in northern LA, tell them to go find <laughs> track down Marlon Newburn because he's not going to sit there and listen to the woe is me story. He's going to put yeah. a mirror up and say, "Listen, people, you're the pro you're the cause of your own problem. So why don't you figure that out? And uh, you know, then we can then we can do something here. Oh am yeah. I, uh, am I going to get in trouble for practicing psychology without a license here? Nah, not at all. Not at all. It just when you have somebody say that once they take charge of uh, take responsibility for all their choices. Uh, okay, once you they ask do, me to do that, and when I hear people say, "Yeah, oh yeah, I, I'm definitely going to do that," well, except except for that, yeah, that's, that's right. That's the free. That's where you drive the truck through. There is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly yes. Yeah, there's always the exception, you know. Never allow an exception. Uh, you know, mommy didn't really love me that much. Didn't love me and. It was, you know, uh, I, I used the uh, example of uh, the one client I had, great gal, 
a uh, great lady, really, uh, very prosperous, but was married five times. And uh, they were all failures, this sort of thing. And then finally, after listening for several sessions, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of tissues went and a lot of crying and this sort of thing, I finally had to, as diplomatically as possible, explain to her who picked them. This wasn't a one-way street. Uh, at first, that didn't go over too well, but eventually... <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, she realized that, like, I picked these high risk, impossible to get close to males. And uh, then, you know, we started really being able to, to work at um, healing, you know, it, it started to work. But until she took responsibility of the fact that it took two in this decision making process, um, she was going to continue to make that same kind of mistake. So it's, uh, you know, who do you choose? It's blaming the, and damning, blaming, blaming and damning. And damning. Absolutely. And she lived a miserable life up and to that. And blaming is, is, is really the act of shirking personal responsibility. And, of you know, course. here's the weird thing. Listen, I mean, though, I think probably the, at least the hardest thing for me to, to do when I'm talking about this is I'm sitting here. I'm not presenting myself as a perfect person. Um, me so I'm sitting here going, listen, people, we got to take responsibility for our own crap. If somebody wanted to look at my life and go, well, Colin, when you were in eighth grade, you did that. Like, I have to say, yeah. So I don't, I kind of like, it's almost like, kind of resent in a way being put in a position where I'm the one who has to stand up and go take responsibility for your own crap and quit blaming stuff on me and anybody yeah. else. Yeah. I mean, that's just it. It's like, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> and sometimes, you know, I don't like to take responsibility for what I've done, some of the choices I've made, but the reality is it's empowering when you do. It just really is. It, uh, you realize that you have much more power in your life, no matter what your income is. And uh, you have much more uh, power in, in uh, your decision-making, uh, where you go, what you do. It's just all empowering altogether. Yeah, so. except for that white people racism thing. I know. That way uh, they can stay under fire and uh, watching out for drive-by shooting. So, I mean, the biggest victims of black violence are... Black ooh. people, no doubt. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, that's true. But that yeah. also, but just because that's true, that doesn't uh, negate the fact that there's the white on the black on white violence is wildly out of proportion as well. No. <laughs> well, black on white violence is absolutely crazy out of out of control. And here's the thing: it all depends. Like you know, it, it, when you hear the numbers, they're always national numbers, right? Yeah. But if you yeah. eliminate it, like large portions of the country where black people do not live and maybe just concentrated on say places like Philly or Chicago or wherever, even LA, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the numbers would look even crazier. Yeah. yeah. There was a story out today and I have to look at it, but it's, um, it's, it's some rate is some of the mo most recent racial crime numbers. And they're just as wildly out of proportion as you can get. And, yeah. and, and, and uh, a guy, I don't, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't really read, I don't really deal with the people at American Renaissance. They're, they're racialists, they're segregationists. I don't deal with them. I don't, I don't want to be any part of that world. But he, but somebody forwarded me a story he wrote today, and I didn't, I read it before I even saw who wrote it. But at the bottom it said, and surprisingly, black crime has gone down over the last ten years. This is coming from Jared Taylor. Mm -hmm. What, what I don't think he recognized is something I spent a lot of time writing about in my book is how prevalent witness intimidation is now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the black community is, is widespread. And so you got, A, you got stitches for snitches where it never yeah. goes, where nobody, you know, nobody ever gets arrested. But if somebody gets arrested, I was talking about this last night to somebody who's, go, I'm going to do a podcast with him next week, mm -hmm. that he, he was a victim of a, a bunch of black people, attacked him, he fought back. Uh, they, they caught him by accident. But when they mm -hmm. caught him, like five other people step forward and go, oh, yeah, those, those are the guys that robbed me. This was like in an upper-class white neighborhood, okay? Yeah. And um, so they go to court, and um, the very first thing, uh, and they keep delaying the trial. Oh, let, me, let me do a parenthetical thing here. On, on uh, PBS, on the um, uh, whatever the PBS evening news show is now, they were talking about the kid that was in Riker Island for three years, two years mm -hmm. for no reason. You know, he never got a trial got out two years later, committed suicide. So they brought a defense lawyer on there, and she said, well, it's common when we show up to court, the prosecutors aren't ready for us. And the person from PBS is just shaking their head going, oh, that's a shame, when, in fact, it's the opposite. The defense lawyers are the ones 
always pushing the trial off because of my friend's case. They started out with like five defendants, every de- every, but every time they had a continuance, they'd lose one. Mm-hmm. So literally a year after the crime, my buddy's the only one sitting there, but he's sitting in the front row going, I'm not going, I'm going to be here for the rest of time. I don't care. But, but one of the functions uh, uh, of, um, uh, uh, of the delay is to give the friends time to do the witness intimidation thing. I mean, you go into people, you tell me how many times have you been in court? I think they kind of try to stop this now, but when the, when the family of the predator is in the court, they're, mm-hmm. they're hooting, hollering, intimidating the witnesses oh, yeah. and the family yeah. of the victims. That's uh, that's devastating. It is devastating. It's demoralizing. And, of course, the victim's family wants things to be wrapped up and get it over as soon as possible uh, because they're afraid. And it's uh, they, You have to understand, especially in the black community, they know that um, most people fear physical violence. Peaceful people do. If they realize that uh, acting like an animal will pay dividends for them to include getting that family member off and getting them, uh, you know, getting their case thrown out. So much of that happening now. And, 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 you know, it it kind of reminds me of these jobless numbers. You hear about the unemployment's down. Well, fewer people are working now than ever before. But the unemployment numbers are totally unreliable indicator of economic health. So people talk mm-hmm. about crime rates in the same way all over the country. But people, co- cops are saying, listen, the, co- the, cr- the crime, I talk about this in my book, whether it's Chicago, New York, Baltimore, LA, Portland, Seattle, they're jigging, they're jiggering the numbers and they're mm-hmm. cooking the books and, f- and making the crime rate go down, making their places look a lot safer than they really are. Yeah. Yeah. It's there. They you have to lie to sustain a fantasy. You really do. Wow. Got, I say that again. You have to lie to sustain a fantasy. Wow. That's and, a good uh, one. You, you do. You have to do that. So, and if you subscribe to a value system where lying's legitimate, and it's okay. Well, you know which uh, which system allows that sort of thing. Besides, no, let me close this. I'll, I'll, let me close this uh, uh, pod. We've gone on for a while. I want to let you go. Let me close this one little story from from Charlie Wrangle. Does that name ring a bell? Oh, sure. So sure. In, in the nineteen eighties, uh, I found myself like Charlie in a room with Charlie for a couple hours, just Charlie, me, and a few other people. And he was, of course, regaling people with stories about his life. And one hmm. of the things he got he he took the most delight in telling was. When he was on radio, this was before the internet, of course, when he would, he would do interviews or when he was on a TV show or a radio show and somebody would ask him a question or he was kind of like backed into a corner, he said he would make things up. Yeah. And, and, and he would always make up a statistic like 87% of black people think white, you know, whatever, you know, just make up a number that proves your case. And nobody ever called him on it. And he thought that was the funniest thing. And I think it fits right into your uh, uh, fantasies require deceit thing. Oh, sure. Sure. And it's like, again, in the black community, there are white rules and there are black rules. And we do not have to follow white rules. Whatever the white rules, if the white rule says to take personal responsibility, then it's legitimate. It's legitimate that we can ignore it. So, you know, I I don't have to tell you the truth because the truth will be a, a white value. So, All right, last question. Are there tons and tons of uh, black people in prison that are there unjustly and we should be letting them out without worrying about it? No, of course not. That's ridiculous. I mean, whoever came up with that is an absolute lying idiot. Okay, so, and you can quote me on okay, that. Okay, I'm going I'm to keep that phrase. If you would. Marlon Newburn, <laughs> as usual, your analysis, your humor, your insight into this whole problem of racial violence, black on white crime, black mob violence. That's half of it. The other half is how we ignore it, denone it, condone, condone it, deny it, excuse it, encourage it, even lie about it is, I, th- you know, between you and Jesse Lee Peterson and ma- now maybe even Donald Trump, you three guys might be the most important people in America as far as I'm concerned. Oh, my goodness. I don't know about that, but uh, I do what I can, bud. <laughs> <laughs> Marlon Newburn, many thanks. And uh, if I don't get you back on this podcast in the next couple of weeks, I, th- I have an image of like lots and lots of podcast listeners out there with pitchforks and, and torches at my front door going, <laughs> Newburn, Newburn. <laughs> well, we'll see. Okay. Just give me a call. 
Okay, uh, all the best of luck out there in California, and congratulations on uh, the new life you're embarking on. You know what? You're going to be a very, very popular psychologist in uh in LA, so don't forget your old buddy Colin when you're sitting in when you're sitting in a mansion that makes uh, the 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 uh, Getty Museum in Malibu look like somebody's guest house. <laughs> okay, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> okay, Marla Newburn, psychologist, guest on the this Colin podcast with Colin Flaherty. Many thanks, Marla.